Texas Bermudan League. I'm here in Sublime, Tennessee at the University of the South. And I'm here with Charlie Wright. I would like to start with him introducing himself. Okay, I'm Charlie Wright, uh, raised in Swanee, Tennessee. Finished high school in 1957. Immediately after high school, I left Swanee because it wasn't really no jobs around here for a black person, except working for the university, and you know. So I went, moved to Chattanooga, no, I went to Florida, stayed in Tallahassee, Florida for about a year, came back to Swanee, stayed maybe a couple months. Then I moved to Chattanooga and from there, I got drafted into the military. I did 26 years in the military. And I lived in well, Washington, D.C. for 20 years. Came back to Swanee when my mother got bad off sick. I stayed here seven years, or seven and a half years until she died. While I was here, I built her a house. It was a habitat house, but everybody in Swanee said I did 80% of the work, which is probably true. So when she died, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia area. I been, stayed there for well, maybe 19 years, and I'm recently moving back to, the, uh, to Tennessee. And uh, right now, I live in Tallahoma with my nephew. And I'm in the uh, progress of purchasing me a house. Tell me when you were born. I was born 17th of August, 1938. As of today, I'm 80 years old. But most people tell me that I look like I'm 65, 70. But I, Good exercise and eating right all your life, being nice to people. It gives you a nice outlook on life. Who are your who were your parents? My mother's name was Lacey Bright, and my father was George Bright. My mother did dom domestic work here in Swanee, and my father worked at the hospital. It was a Dr. Uh, Henry, Henry Kirby, uh, Kirby Smith, I think that was his name. But anyway, he claimed that he couldn't do no operation unless my daddy was there to assist him. And as a young boy, I think we had the first, we were the first blacks family in Swanee to have a telephone because Dr. Henry said he needed to get in touch with my daddy if he had to do an operation or something. Did he hand them the instruments? Was he like a scrub tech today? Well, I don't know what all he did in the opera. He never really talked about it, but Dr. Henry didn't do no operations unless my daddy was there. And I guess during World War, World War II, uh, the hospital, well, I think it was Emerson Hospital, I think it was the name of it. But anyway, they kept him out of the military because they said he was part of the operation. Uh, when they operated on people, he was part of that team. So he missed the, uh, the military back then because of that. And you said it was Dr. Henry Kerber Smith? I think it was Kerber Smith. Kerber Smith? Okay. I think that was his name. But Do you know what type of doctor he was? Was it general practice? Or? He, he did general practice and he did all kinds of operate, you know, on people, different kind of, when he took the scalpel and cut on people, he did all different kinds of stuff like that. And do you have any recollection of, of any of the skills that your 
father had, was he able to actually help with the suturing or anything like that? I don't really know exactly what he did because he never really talked about it. You know, but uh, all I know is that Dr. Henry didn't do no operation unless George Bright was there with him. And uh, when was George Bright born? He was born, what is it, 1907, I believe. And uh, I'm not for sure what year that he came to, that we moved to Swanee. Uh, but we, as far as I know, this is the only place that I remember as a coming up as a young from. I was knee high to a duck coming up. Where did you say he was born? I'm not for sure where my father was born, but uh, he lived in Winchester with his uh, with his daddy, and his daddy's name was Charlie Bright. Uh, and then we moved up here, you know. So you're named after your grandfather? After, yes. And um, your mother, what what was her maiden name? Her, her maiden name was Mosley. She was from Cameron, Tennessee. Uh, they met and they liked each other, so they got married and they moved up here and and my uh, my mother used to be well as a little as a little boy. She she did all the whooping and everything, <laughs> you know. Like if, if if me and my brother, you know, we were some bad little boys. If we did something, we would always try to stay away until my daddy come. And he give us one lick and we start hollering. He think he did something. But my mother, she tell her, go out there and get a switch, boy. You had to go out there and get your own switch, which was, you know, maybe three or four feet long. You come back, she said, hard head and make a soft A. <laughs> and she put that stick on you. In. But every day, man, my brother, we seemed to do something to, uh, get that stick put on one way or another. Were there just two of you? Well, it was, uh, my sister was two years older than, than me. What was her name? Her name was Julia Matilda Bright. But she was kind of like on the good side of whatever she did, she kept it here from from my mother, so it was always me and my brother, we used to get that switch. And what was your brother's name? Sammy Ray Bright. And he lived in Swanee, matter of fact, all his life, he, he went to the, he was in the military for, I think, two, three years. We went, and then he came back here, and he was here in Swanee until he died. Were you in the military together? We ended up being in Germany together. And we, we used to visit each other. He was like maybe 75 clicks. They were kilometers, but they called them clicks. We was about that far from each other, but about every other month we used to want to go visit the other. What years were these? That was, an, uh, I went to Germany in 19, 1963 to 1965. I spent two years in Germany, came back to the States. Then I was stationed at Fort Eustis and Fort Carson. And then the Vietnam conflict came up, so I went to Vietnam twice. Well, let's, let's get to that in a little bit, because I think you probably should fill that in a little bit. 
but I want to go back to um, growing up in Sewanee and telling me um, what, what is something that really stands out to you about those days? Well, uh, we had a, the teacher's name was Miss Gertrude Kennedy. And we used to go, uh, it was, I think, St. Mark's Church. I started off going to school there, and then maybe my, it was all in one classroom, you know. Then. That was in the church? In the church. And, uh, like, you know, we, everybody be sitting out there in the, in the, uh, the sanctuary. sanctuary, but uh, she had a this in front, and the first through the eighth grade, all went to this one church or school, and then by the time I was in the maybe the seventh grade, they had built a school, just a little piece from the church. What years were these? Well. Let me see. I started the high school in 53. So they must have built the school in, I'm going to say, maybe 51. And St. Mark's is gone now. Can you describe it to me? What was it like? Well, St. Mark's was a, uh, it was just, uh, just well, maybe like a one room big church wasn't really that big but it was just uh one big area in this in this uh in this one building and uh did it have any back rooms i can't remember if they had that like the sanctuary up here they, i think they had a maybe a room to the side for the uh for the priests but uh, I think that was about the size of it. Was it wood or brick? It was, I think, I believe it was a wooden church. And uh, because I think after they, uh, we went to start going to the, to the school, after they built the school, and then a few years later, they took and uh, started going to, I think up here to older Paris, but for years they, you know, all the blacks went to this St. Mark's church. And uh, what was the priest's name that you, do you remember? I can't remember what his name was. What do you remember about the teacher? What was her name again? Her name was Gertrude Kenley. Kenley? Kenley. Yes. And what do you remember about her? Well, Miss Gertrude, she wasn't very tall, but she was like very firm on you. You know, if you did, if you messed up, you know, back then the teacher used, you know, they could whoop you up, chastise you, and uh, she was a very good teacher, because when I, in 57, when I finished high school, I mean, I'm sorry, when I finished, I started the high school in 57, but uh, when I went to high school in, in Winchester, uh, Miss Gertrude had did such a good job that like, it was an, one more guy named John Scott that lived, I think, from Decker. But like when they had the, uh, we used to have the test in, uh, we didn't have algebra at that time in high school. I think it started a year after I went to the, uh, the first book. Me and this one guy, we were so smart that when the teacher had the test, she said, y'all get out. Because we used to write down the answer and pitch it to other guys. You know, somebody didn't know that. What's the answer, John? Little piece of paper, you know. So, after 
She saw what was going on. When they had them tests, y'all going out. And then like at the end, you know, when you had to take the final exam, she put him way up in that corner and me over in this corner, you know. And his name was uh, John Scott. Graduate, we graduated in uh, 57. And that was from your, uh, the grades, from the eighth grade or from? No, that was from high from school. From high school yes. you graduated in 57. Okay. Um, and Miss Gertrude, how, she, how many classes did she teach? How, what was the age range? She taught from the first grade through the eighth grade. You know, she had time for everybody. How did she do that? Were you in different areas of the room? Well, like the, the uh, seventh and eighth grade, they was like on the, front, the front, first two rows. And then, you know, like the fifth, sixth, you know. But she would start them all. And then she'd be back here teaching you this. And I remember one time she was out here with a book. <laughs> she said, uh, she asked the seventh and eighth grade how many letters in the alphabet. And they come up with, you know, all these different numbers. But they was right across the board behind the desk. And I said, 26. I raised my hand. She said, Charlie, that's a seventh and eighth grade question. I said, I know, Miss Gertrude. I said, but I know the answer. She said, what is it, Charlie? I said, 26. She said, how do you know? I said, any fool could look up there and count them. You know, it was, you know, right across her. That this was the desk, right behind the desk. They was Red Cross up there, you know. What grade were you in at the time? I probably was in about the fifth grade then. You know, but it was the seventh and eighth grade question, you know. You know, and she asked them, they would come up with all these different numbers. And she was just, I raised my hand. What is the child? I said, 26. I told her, any fool could look up there and count them. She came back there, bam! with a book. <laughs> she said, that's for saying fool. <laughs> but uh, Miss Gertrude Keller was a, a good teacher. Did you have desk? Uh, you, had, you were on pews, but... We had these... Uh, Slates? No, these little bitty desks made with a chair to it. Yeah. The, um... You know, yeah, it was, that have the little the, slap that the, the up. top of it, you know, was that angle like this, but the top would raise oh. up, and you could put your books and things in there, and it was the chair, and the desk, you know, and the little desk, you know, the, the desk, and then there was a little piece connecting it, like here, but you, you had to get in from the side, you know, but. Now, for uh, Sundays, did they move those desks? They moved them back in the back, and then, then they bought the, pe the, the pews back, you know. So may maybe there was a back room to put the desks? No, they, they just, I can't remember, but I think they just put them way back against the back wall there, you know. So you grew up Episcopal? Episcopal, yes. What are your memories about that, about um, your parish, your, uh, the, the faith community? Well, the, the majority of the black people that went to church went to the uh, St. Mark's Episcopal Church was the name of it. And uh, they had, uh, at that, during that time, it was one of the white uh, Episcopal ministers from All Saints, uh, or from the, you know, there was a Episcopal school here in Swanee. One of them, you know, used to 
come down and have service for us, you know. So there was a white priest yes. that came. And you never had an African American minister? Not while I was there. And to skip, go forward a little bit, I think until a lady named Matilda, uh, she was from Africa, and she had came, her, her husband was a professor here at the university, and uh, she went to seminary school, and she used to be, that was when they moved to All Saints here, though. But during my time, we used to always, this, uh, one of the white ministers from what you know, all saints, so used to come down and have church for us. Did you have other functions at the church? Were there weddings? Were there? They, the only thing they I can remember is like, they used to have these Christmas plays. And on the Christmas plays, it used to be, uh, you know, like the, the three wise men, right? It was like me, my brother, and another guy named Joel Kenley. And me and uh, Joel Kenley, we couldn't sing with a nickel. <laughs> so, you know, they used to have to have a, have a little song, a little something that we used to have to, you know. So me and Joel, we used to have to just repeat hours by talking, and they used to let my brother Ray, he, used, he was a pretty good singer, you know, he used to sing his part, but like me and Joel, we had to just, you know, like, just like talking it out. And uh, who, well, how, you had it in the church, the play? Yes. Did you have a, a raised area in the church? I think it was, you know, like, it was, uh, I think it was a raised area in the, you know. For the in altar? The, for the, uh, up in the sanctuary over there. What other memories do you have of, of St. Mark's? Well, I guess that was probably about it. What is your last memory of St. Mark's? My last memory? Well, you know, like Christmas. They used to have this uh, Christmas uh, party or whatever they want to call it. You know, they, they have a present or something for all the kids, you know. And, you know, like this guy named uh, Jeannie Perkins, used to always play Santa Claus, you know. He was uh, one of the elder black guys that lived here in Swanee. And other than that, I think that's pretty much it on that part. Um, with integration, the blacks left St. Mark's, is that correct? Yes, they, they left St. Mark's and uh, started going, coming up here to Old Paris. But uh, by, by that time, I had done left someone in that area for good because right out of high school, you know, I said, well, it really not a whole lot here. So if you don't work for the university, you know, and like most of the guys, you know, they either they were janitors or they worked at, uh, it wasn't Gala Hall, but it was another, they, it was a, another mess hall that they had, you know, at the time. So you, you worked for, you know, really wasn't work, anything. Matter of fact, in all the Franklin County, it was, the Pickens was poor for the job Matter of fact, for black South whites, you know, back then. And you said your mother was a domestic? 
Yes. What, do you know who she worked for? She worked for this one lady. Uh, the the man the man name was Stratton Buck. And matter of fact, the daughter and married to this guy uh, Ned McCready, and they live here in Swanee now. But I think my mother worked for them for probably 15 or 20 years until I think when uh, Mr. Buck retired, he moved to, I'm not for sure whether it was North or South Carolina, but he moved to one or the other. And then even after they moved, they used to send my mother a retirement check of fifty dollars every month. They sent uh, Miss Buck sent her uh, a check for fifty dollars every month. What years were those that she worked for the Bucks? I'm gonna say from maybe maybe from nineteen fifty on up to. I think so I finished high school. You know, she was still working for him, you know. And uh when he did retire, you know, they like I said, they moved to I'm not for sure with North or South Carolina, but one of them, you know. And uh, even when when Miss Buck died, her daughter started sending my mother the fifty dollar checks every month. And uh they used to fuss all the time. My mother and Miss Buck, they used to they 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 was a trip, you know, of course they used to fuss a lot. Playfully they would... Oh no, they get they get mad at each other. My mother would quit. Miss Buck go down there and they say, come on Lacey <laughs> And you know they go she go back to work, you know, but now, um, did she take care of the children or the ha just the house? Just, you know, clean it up with the house and she used to cook for them. Yeah. So she was a good cook? Yes, she was. What were some of her specialties? Believe it or not, she didn't have one. She could cook everything. It's like when I was, I think, nine years old, my mother got sick, so we, you know, me and my brother and sister, we used to have to wait till my daddy come home in the afternoon to fix, you know, or something to eat, or, you know, in the, in the evening. So when my mother got well, when she was sick, it was something about her throat, she couldn't talk. She just could just whisper. So the first word she said when she was, when the throat got better, I'm going to teach y'all how to cook. And she would have us, like, she hit the stove, hit she is, and we'd be around there. And, you know, whatever she would say, you better listen. <laughs> and one time, you know, I was looking up, she said, Bill! Pop myself, pay attention, boy. And so, you know, I turned out to be an excellent cook myself, you know, because, you know, like I said, I started off at nine. And I guess the time I was 12, 13, I can make a cake just as good as anybody. And you know, that's because, you know, she started us off, then care what she was cooking. Y'all come on. She had to stand there. She'd be telling her, I put a little of this, a little of that, and she'd be watching me see if you're paying attention, you know. Were they measured? A little bit? Or Some of them, you know, she would measure, you know. Can you make a cake without measurements? Mm -hmm. oh, that's a skill. <laughs> um, so is there a special type of cake? Now we used to, uh, you know, back, you know, we used to make uh, like a yellow cake, you know, that, that the inside of the cake would be, be yellow. And then, you know, the white icing or the chocolate icing. 
you know, she taught us how to do the whole works, you know, how to make pies, you know, and put the, roll the dough out, and put it over and take the fork and go around the edge, you know. Everything that she knew how to do, cooking, she, she showed me, my brother, and my sister, all of, you know, how to do it. When she was working for the, the Bucks? Was, yes. Um, did she have to do parties for them? Sometimes she did. Uh, I remember one time she, Ms. Buck, she messed up on something. Miss Buck said something to her, and she said, okay, I'm gone. <laughs> she just left everything right there, you know. But a couple of days later, Miss Buck came down there, and they said, I know we had a little misunderstanding, but come on, we got, we got stuff here that need to be done in my house now. So Miss Buck would come down and get her, you know, and... It sounds like they understood each other. Yeah, they, 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 they was a trip, you know, because they would talk mean, nice, all kind of, you know. But, you know, I guess they had been together so long, you know. And uh, Mrs. Buck's first name was? I, I, I was trying to think. I remember her husband's name was Stratton Buck. So they, uh, that's okay. I can't remember what her name, you know, because we always used yeah. to say Miss Buck, yeah. you know. Um, tell me about <clears throat> how did you play when you were young? Well, um, we, uh, we made a basketball uh, court, and uh, we used to play basketball. And uh, but some of the students and all, uh, some of the guys from the university came down, you know. And like I said, we had we had uh, you know they had bought the concrete, you know. We had dug out this you know, regular basketball court and had the two posters up with the, with the hoops and we used to play basketball and then we used to play a um, little baseball. Where did you set up the basketball court? It was on um, uh, they have a little clubhouse, a community clubhouse in um, Mm, I think it might have been Alabama Avenue. But anyway, uh, it, it was in that area there. Was this for the African Americans? Yes. And who were you saying came from the university? Uh, some of the students, uh, some of the faculty. The whites? Yes, came down, you know, and uh, they helped us make it. And, uh, you know, like I said, we, we had dug it out, but you know, and then they had the cement trucks come in, pull the cement, and we we smoothed it off, you know. Did you help with that? Yes. Matter of fact, all all of the young guys, you know, my age, they helped with it. About how old were you then? Uh, maybe twelve or thirteen. Somewhere along in there. Now you um, around here. Did did people go f fishing or go? Uh, well, go they had, we used to go fishing all the time, and uh, I think my daddy caught the biggest bass up here in Swanee that was ever caught. It was about. Must have been about six, seven pounds, you know, and uh, they got a picture of him and he's standing up, you know, but the bass was all the way down to the to the ground when they're holding it, you know, like this. It was, so, you know, it was pretty good size bass. Where did he catch it? I'm not, I think he caught it over by the, it's a, 
but the cemetery is two lakes over there. I can't think. I know I can't. I don't remember the name of the street, but uh, uh, you know they got two cemeteries here in Swanee. So anyway, the one cemetery then the, down the street is two lakes. You know, like one here and then one over here. He caught them. He caught the bass in one of those lakes. Do you know what year that was? That must have been. I don't remember what year, but uh, it was, it, you know, it, it was a big bass, and it was, they say it was the biggest bass that would ever been caught in Swanee. Did your father teach you how to fish? I didn't like fishing that much when I was coming up. We used to go with them, you know, and uh, later on I became a very good fisherman. What else did you do around here with your friends or your family? Well, back then, it, it really wasn't a lot to do. You know, I mean, it wasn't a lot of different places uh, to do it when I was coming up, you know. Like now, you know, like children got everything to play with. Back then, uh, like for Christmas, you got one or two toys, you know. And other than that, you know, it wasn't so. We used to play out hiding seats out in the woods and different different things, you know. You were creative. Yes. Um. Now, back then, where did your family live? It, where can you pinpoint the house for me? Where the house was located? Is it still standing? No, uh, I'm gonna have to jump forward a little bit. When my mother got uh, bad off sick, uh, I was living in Washington, D.C., so she, she called, used to call me and my sister, you know, tell us she liked one of us to come back and help her because my brother was, he was, he was sick too. So anyway, I moved back to Tennessee and I moved back here to Swanee. What year was that? Uh, I think it was maybe 90s, 97, 98, somewhere along when there. And then when I moved, when I moved back here, uh, they was doing the habitat housing things. But I had been doing carpenter work for almost 20 some years, part time, you know. And I, I thought I was the best carpenter in the world. But anyway, they, uh, I helped build uh, the Turners over by the cemetery. There was, was a family name that the last name was Turners. I helped build their habitat house and then uh, my mothers came up and once my mother's habitat, we started in probably in June, somewhere along in there. But anyway, uh, they started, you know, and once they started the house, you know, I told the guys, I said, we done cleared a lot and everything. And so I told them, I said, look, I said, we ought to be able to, I said, my mother ought to be in here before it get cold. And they laughed at me. That matter of fact, let me see what this guy named, the guy named Dixon. He's uh, in charge of the habitat houses here in Swanee. But anyway, it, it was like maybe seven or eight white guys they did most of the habitat because it wasn't, you know, wasn't a lot of blacks that do anything about building. But, you know, I, I told myself, we need to go ahead, you know, and get started. So Dixon, he said, Charlie said, you know, I said, 
We've been doing these heavy tail pounds for a while, so it's taken us 18 months to do one. I said, yeah. I said, but I'm talking about my mother now. I said, so they like, you know. So anyway, I said, Dixon, I said, you the man, right? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm the man. I said, so in other words, you can have the material here. Anytime the material is neat, I'm the man, child. So anyway, you know, they, they bought, they had the truckload of material come in, and uh, they had this one guy, he came up and did the block, you know, the block work. We had dug, we had dug it out and pulled the, the foundation, and then the guy came in to do the blocks, you know, to come up so high, you know, so. He did the blocks, and I helped him with the, with the blocks, so. When they got through, I asked him, I said, uh, when, can, when can I start putting, framing up and doing stuff? He said, well, you look at this. He said, you can start tomorrow. I said, you mean I can go ahead and, he said, you start tomorrow. So, I took and, you know, started. And it was about a week later, Dixon came down. Dixon said, who did all this? I said, I did it, you know. Oh, we got to slow down. I got to. So Dixon got a light, he had a flashlight. He went, I had, I had this guy come with a bulldozer and, you know, kind of dig out from under the bottom for, you know, so we have a little basin to put my tools and lumber and stuff in. But Dixon, he got this light. He went down there. He looked all over. He came back up. Got to slow it down a little bit. Slow it down. It's okay. I said, when we, I said, when can we start on the wall? Well, we got to, you know, I got a crew coming in. He's about two weeks now. It's okay. Then, you know. I said to myself, when he left, I said, I ain't waiting no two weeks. So I started on the back wall. I, I, I did the back wall, you know, and I had a pickup truck. So by being in the Army, I learned a lot of different skills in the Army. So I had braced up some, I made me some braces and had them all lined up. And I took, but got them, I had them, just ropes coming down to this here, once one to the back wall of the two befores, you know. And I got in my truck and I backed up and wasn't moved. So I went and I raised it each little bit at a time and stood something under there. Anyway, Dixon came down a few days later. He saw the wall, the back wall frame up. Oh, he was mad. Who did all that? I said, I did it. He said, yeah, okay. You did it all this? I said, yeah. Anyway, so if we were process, progressing through, I told Dixon, I said, I asked him, I said, Dixon, I said, as you know, my mother fell a couple of years back getting in and out of the bathtub. I said, she will not get in no bathtub, you know. I said, we got, I said, the plans here, it's called, you know, called for a bathtub and all, you know. I said, we got this long space here that you got a storage area in the washroom. I said, can't we just take a portion of this and uh, make it into a, a extra bath, a shower, you know, I said, just a shower, you know, something she just step over and get it. Now, one bathroom. So, Ned McCrady, you know, he used to come down and help me. I, he saw that I was. So one day, Ned had been down there helping. You know, we had done got 
all just about all the walls up. So Dixon, he came down, he said, had this young lady with him. He said, this is my new sister. So I said, we were talking a while. You know, I asked, I said, I said uh, is your mother still living? She looked at me kind of funny. She said, yeah, child, why you ask? I said, if your mother, if you would be on this house for your mother, and she done fell getting in and out of the bathtub. I said, when you want her to have a little shower over here by herself, you know? She said, oh, child, that, I think that would be very nice. Dixon looked at me, you know, like, I'm gonna get you. <laughs> but anyway, he stayed down there and talked for about 30 minutes. Then him and the lady left, right? So Neil McCready came over and he said, Charlie, so I've known Dixon for years. Said, I ain't never known him to change his mind about nothing. Said, but you tricked him, didn't you? <laughs> anyway, Dixon, you know, before Dixon left, he said, yeah, go on, go on put the bathroom in. So Ned, Ned said, we better go on up there and get, the, and get all the material he said, if you don't have the money, I'll I said, no, I said, I got enough money to get it. So we went up to Montego, and uh, there's a place on the other side of Montego, but we went up and got, got everything, and, and uh, we put the, uh, by, I'm going to go leap forward, by November, no, by October, the house was finished. So, you know, uh, she got to live in it for a while, and then uh, she got real kind of bad off, and the mind kind of, kind of left her, you know. And and my mother has always been real cold nature. <coughs> so one day, uh, one this one night, she had got up, went outside. Left the door wide open. It was a winter time too now. And she had went down the street and she fell in a ditch. So anyway, uh, after that, you know, I, we had to keep a close eye on her. Then she, her health just got uh, deteriorating a little bit. So we had to put her in a nursing home in, uh, in my nigga. So she uh, stayed there for but a couple of years, about a year maybe until she died, you know, but. When did she die? Uh, what was it? She died in uh, 20 years ago yeah. from, I think, about 20 years ago, I think it was. She must have been so proud though to have been in that house. Tell me about the day you showed her the house. Well, she knew about the house all the time, you know. You know, because like we lived over here on this street and the house was like over on the next street, you know. What street was it on? Uh, the house was built on Willie 6th Avenue. Will, Willie? Willie 6th. Willie 6th Avenue. And I think we lived on Alabama Avenue. And like Alabama went this way and Willie 6th came and cut into Alabama, you know. Mm -hmm. It was just like the next street over, you know. Tell me about the day, though, that you took her to the house for the first time that she saw it completed. Do I, you remember that day? I don't really remember, no. but I remember the, the day that uh, when, you know, it was a storm somewhere down the mountain, and they had to pull out all the Duck River people had, had to go down to, to repair lines and stuff. So then when they came back, you know, the house was completed. It's just that all of the electric line, you know, the power people had. So when they came back, they went on here and hooked it up and uh, she moved in and they had, 
It was a lot of people, matter of fact, just about everybody in Swanee came up, uh, you know, when the, the day that she moved into the house. And uh, somebody, I'm, we, I don't know who, never did find out who, but somebody had bought her one of these nice, easy rocking, you know, where she could lean back, you know, and, you know, had the little thing to make the legs come up. But she got to really enjoy it. And I know you were proud, weren't you? Is that house still standing? It's still standing. Uh -huh. You made it well. <laughs> okay. um, and the old house, was that torn down? Well, I did, right after she moved, they took an, uh, the fire department had a, a practice on, you know, setting the house on fire and putting it out, you know. Because, you know, like the house, it was like 60, 70 years old. You know, it was a real old house, you know. Did it have inside plumbing? It did. You know, uh, I'm going to have to go back a little bit. When I was in high school, I took up, you know, we had general building trade. So I had built me, a, a, it was a four-room house. But I had built me a little house, a little room on the side of the house. So when I finished high school, they turned that little room into a bathroom. Before that, you had an outhouse? Yeah, that, matter of fact, 90% of the people in Swanee at one time had an outhouse. And your church also? Yes. Uh, St. Mark's had a St. Mark's had an outhouse. Uh -huh. um, you said that you had a room on the side of the house? Yeah, you know, it, you was, built? it was like a, the house was like square, right? Uh huh. Okay, like this is the front of the house, and here's the front porch right here. Okay, this come down on the back side of there. It was a uh, another house in Swanee that they was, you know, they was going to burn. So I asked them, could I have that lumber? So, you know, they looked at me, but they said, yeah, you can have it. So I got one of the guys that had old pickup truck. To, I told the hip, tear the house down and took all the lumber and carried it over to, over to our house. And, and uh, it, while I was in high school, we had junior building trade for two years. So I... You know, I, I put that skill to use and, and built the house and the roof. It, it didn't leak or nothing, you know. When you built it there, was it just a space that you wanted or you had it was my I, That was my, my senior year, that was my bedroom. <laughs> you know, it, it, like, say like this is the house here. It wasn't a door to come in. My door was on the outside. <laughs> you know, I had to go around, but you know, had a little space heater in there, you know. But it was a. Uh, nice. Then when I finished high school and left, uh, we had a cousin named uh, living in Winchester. He was a plumber. He came and turned that into a bathroom. So. Um in high school, did most students have trades, learn trades? The 10th and 11th grade had two hours every day of trade school. They had, uh, you know, the shop and everything. You learn how to cut wood and how to sand wood, you know, with the, with the planer. And, uh, it was, it was a nice class, you know. Did your high school just go to the 11th grade then? 12th grade. It did go to the 12th grade. Yeah, we had to go to, uh, once you finish uh, the 8th grade up here, you had to catch the bus and go to Winchester to the high school. There was no high school in Sewanee? No. How long did it take you to uh, go by bus? Well, it took about 20, 30 minutes. 
it, it's it's like it's only four. It's just say it was 15 miles from. We used to have to walk downtown uh, by the little store, but we was on this side of the street, and the bus used to pick everybody up right there and take you to take you to school and put you out. Then when school was out, you caught the bus back in the afternoon, drove you up, put you out right there. What are the stories that you heard growing up about the university? What did, you, do, did you hear about the founding of the university or anything specific about the university? Not a lot about the university, no. Did you have a lot of friends and families, uh, people that you knew that worked in the university? Well, now, as a, as a young guy, it, it was like maybe 250 to 300 black people that used to be in Swanee most of the time and like out of that 250, 300, uh, three, I'm gonna say 220 to 260 of them worked for the university. Were there any stories told about what went on at the university or something that sticks out in your mind, something that happened at the university? No, those stories were nothing like that. Were you pretty separated from that, the university life at that point? You didn't really uh, see much of what happened? I, I, I don't really have my bearings, but were you close to the university where you lived? Uh, no, we wasn't. I guess from where I lived at, it took you maybe 10, 15 minutes. You could walk, you know, you'd be up in the university area. Did you see the students very much? We saw them. And like they had one movie theater, you know, like we used to walk up to the university and uh, go see the movies, you know. Where did you have to sit when you went to the movie theater? The, like you come in and they had this little space over here for, for the blacks to sit. On the same level? It, it was like a downstairs, it wasn't no, it might have been three rows from here to the wall. And then they had, you could go upstairs on, in that same little area and sit up there. They had seats the upstairs, yes, in the balcony. So you had seats up, up there and then you had seats down here. On the level, on the ground level, on there the were ground seats level. in the back. Yes, and then they had some upstairs right over like, you know, over these, you know. So this, you're saying maybe like three rows in the back? I think it was probably maybe about three rows, you know, like, and it was maybe from that wall to that wall long, and you know, you had room to about go up the steps. About 12 feet across. Yeah. And um, so what was it like to, to, uh, Intermix, was there any racial in incidents that you remember? Any? Um... Not when I was coming up, it wasn't any own thing. Was it pretty set? Well, it, if most people were working for the university, yes. so you were pretty mixed in. It wasn't as segregated here as some places, I guess. No, but you, you know, it, it's like uh, the black people had their area and the white people had their area. How about the stores downtown? What was that like? Well, you could, it, okay, they had this one little cafe. And uh, if, say like for instance, you're black and you want to get a hamburger, you go around to the back door and order your hamburger. They, come and take your order and your money and bring the hamburger to you. You go and eat the hamburger walking down the street or something. Uh, like the stores, it was like, I think, 
two or three grocery stores. One with Mr. Long, and then they had another one down the street from him. I think they had one more across the street. But you know, you could go into any of the stores and you know, and buy buy stuff. You know, one no one no problem with that. You know. What was the name of the cafe? I don't remember the name of the cafe, but as far as I can think, it, I think they had. It was only one cafe when I was coming up as a little boy. And uh, matter of fact, it, as you go down this street there, it's like the gas station over here on the left, the cafe was like top of the hill here on this side. What's the name of the street? Uh, this main road right out here. Okay. I can't think of the name okay. of it. But, I um, don't know what's the water either, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Um, so was, were there any businesses downtown that were owned by blacks? No. Did blacks have any businesses in the African American area? No. They, we, they had, uh, a little clubhouse that blacks used to run, you know. It was over there. Uh, well, anyway, that we it was just. I guess it might have been from that wall over to this wall, from here to there to that wall over, you know. About twenty by twenty. Something like that. And it was a, uh, you know, they sold drinks. Uh, beer, you know, a little stuff social like, club. Uh -huh. Did they have dances here? They used to have just look, just uh, people from around here. Used to, all the all the blacks used to go there, and they didn't have a band or anything, you know. But you know, they had a jukebox and tables and stuff for you to sit at, you know. Did you, uh, well, did people dance much there? Or yeah. it was mainly? Yeah, okay. no, they got out there and floor and dance and everything. Mm -hmm. How about you growing up? Did you have uh, social events where you had dances or anything like that? Not a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in high school, you know, we used to have, uh, they had a, uh, down the mountain, they had a few little cafes and things that was black on and we used to go down there, but up here they had this one little, one little building. And uh, What was the uh, influence of the Episcopal priests on, on your life, on this community? Do you think they influenced the social um I don't think they it was that they had that much of an influence on the on the uh are you a principal? I I was, yeah. Okay, you know like and even say like for instance in the church, you know, that like, I think it's pretty much the same as, you know, they would had the Bible open, they'd be reading over here, then they would move it over on this side. It was pretty much like that, you know, but, and most of the, like I said, most of the blacks went to church up here, and I think the majority of them was, was Episcopal, you know. What do you hear about the integration, when integration occurred here? What happened with St. Mark's merging? And uh, what occurred at that time? I wasn't here at that time. You know, you just hear what people say. You know, what do they say? They, they, uh, I was I was told that when they first closed St. Mark's and the blacks started coming over here to Old Paris, that the first time they came, I think they was they told me. 
part of the white people got up and left. You know, this is just what people, you know, like I said, I wasn't leaving here at the time, but this is what I was, what I was told. And then after a while, you know, they gradually accepted it, uh, you know, and. Why did they close St. Mark's? I don't really know, except that it was, you know, it was an old, antique-like church, you know, building, you know, it was wood structure, you know, and, and it had been there, seemed like forever and a day. And, you know, these old buildings, eventually, you know, they just deteriorate. Did it seem worn down when you were going to school there? It wasn't. It was in pretty good shape when I was going to school there. Did the African American community take pride in it? Did they keep it up? Yes, it, it, they kept it up pretty good, you know. Was it decorative at all? I, I really don't remember, you know. I remember, I know that, you know, like it had the uh, you know, the altar up there and pretty much it was kind of laid out like it is in All Saints, you know. But um, it was just that it was a, a real old, old church, you know. And uh, they just, you know, I guess it just deteriorated and they just okay, so we're going to move the blacks. We're going to tear this church down and, you know, the blacks are going to start coming to our saints. Now, when you graduated from high school, that's when you left? When I left. Like, I graduated today. We used to go down to a church camp that the Episcopal Church used to run in uh, Florida. We used to go down there and work during the summer. Tell me about that. And uh, it was it was like it was a white Episcopal Church camp, but like the guys that worked up here at the university, you know, they used to go down there and work during the summer. Cause you know the the school would be closed for the summer. So I went down there like probably three summers in a row and worked. Well, what you do? We worked in the kitchen and, you know, uh, helped the cook, clean up the kitchen and clean up the, after the, the all the little campus, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know. But then my senior, my senior year, when I finished school, high school, I went down there that that's that summer to work, and I just said, "Ain't nothing in Swanee for a black guy except work for the university." So I went down there that year. So I just stayed in Florida for a year. After the church camp was over, I stayed down there. You know the. The chef, the the cook, you know, he, he was he lived in Tallahassee, and me and him got to be good friends, and I moved, I stayed with them for a couple months, and then I got my own little place. And I stayed, I stayed in Tallahassee, Florida, for about a year. So the once the students left for the summer, some of them went to this camp. No, it wasn't the students, the it was like uh, other churches, the, you know, like children went to the summer camp. The, uh, younger children. Younger children, yes. But it was run by the Episcopal by Church. By the Episcopal Church. And so a lot of the um, African Americans in this community, this, that were, they were unemployed when, yeah, this, if, when the school like, closed? Most of them were. And it was like maybe five 
of us that used to go down there at this church, I mean, this church camp during the summer and work, you know. We would, you know, be working in the kitchen, you know, the, and uh, we would help serve, you know, like serve the people and stuff like that, you know, but. What did other uh, African-Americans do during the summer when the school was closed? I think the majority of them was able to draw a little unemployment. I think, now I'm not for sure. Because, you know, like I said, I was just a teenager at that time, you know. So how did you uh, go from that into the Army? Well, I got drafted into the Army, and I stayed in two years. What and year was that that you went I got in? drafted into the Army in, what, 60, 61. So I was in a couple of years, and I got out, and I was living in Chattanooga at the time, so when I got out, I couldn't find a, a job that I lacked. So I was walking down the street one day, and I passed the, the Army recruiting place. I went in there and uh, asked the guy, you know, so what can you do for an old soldier? He said, well, we can re-enlist you. So, I re-enlisted back and went to Germany and I stayed in Germany for a couple years. Came back and I ended up, I spent three years in Hawaii. Then I went to Vietnam twice. What was that like? To me, it wasn't bad because on my MOS, I was an inspector on helicopters. So I was always back in the rear area. You know, I went out there where they was shooting and dropping bombs or throwing grenades on you all the time. Where were you stationed in Vietnam? First year, I was in a place called uh, Tun Son Nu. It's like, here's Saigon. Tunsil New was the airport right outside of Saigon. So I was there for a year. I came back to the States. And I was in the States eight months, and I had orders to go back to Vietnam a second time. So I went back a second time to Vietnam, and I was like in a place called Long Bend, which was like probably 12 miles from Saigon. And I was always in a nice spot when I was over there because because of what my MOS was. I was in work, worked on helicopter. Either I was inspecting helicopters and you was always back in a secured area. Where was your uh, basic training? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. When you first? When I first, first went into the, the, yeah, to the military. How old were you then? I was, what, 20, 20, 22, 23, when I got drafted. And that was, let's see. So what happened between leaving high school and getting drafted? Well, I, I came back, you know, I, I then went to Florida and stayed. I stayed down there for a year. So I got to of Florida. Then I moved back. To and, Chattanooga? Yeah, moved back to Chattanooga. And then uh, I was in Chattanooga for a couple of years, I think, when I got drafted into the Army. Uh, where did you meet your wife? Did, did you meet? Well, actually, you know. Four wives then. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, the first one I met was in Chattanooga, you know, and I always been like this. If it's just say, like, if me and you get married, if we can't, you know, we got to argue and fuss and raise sand, I don't want to be around you. So, 
<laughs> After, you know, I like to say, we, if you don't get along with somebody, why stay around them all the time? So I just took and, you know, I say, look, we don't get along, it's time, you know. So. What was her name? My first wife's name is Emma. Last name? She was a Clopton. Clopton? Yeah, she was from uh, from Alabama. But I met her in Chattan in Tennessee, in Chattanooga. So uh, then, uh, well, we stayed married 13 years. You have children? We got two boys. Well, now they, the oldest one is what, 57, and the other one is 55. What are their names? Charlie uh, Jr. and the other name is Joseph Ray. And then after that, well, I was in the, I was in the military and I met this other young lady in uh, in Maryland. So what's we, her name? Her name was Joan Bright. Now Joan Healy. And then after we married, changed it to Bright. Well we stayed married, oh probably about twelve years. And then we kinda of went our separate ways. Do you remember when you got married that for the second time or the first time? Uh, it's okay. The second, the first time was in 61. The second time, I think it was in 76, 78, no, it was in 78. And uh, we had we had one one son. What's his his name? name is his name is Marcus. And then things changed, so we got a divorce. So then when I moved back here to take care of my mother, I met a young lady here, and her name was Janice Allgood. Well, we ended up getting married and things didn't work out, so we got a divorce. And then after my mother died, I was, I said, I'm, I need to get out from this area, you know, so I moved to uh, Decatur, Georgia. And I stayed down there for about 19, 19 years. And I did a, I did a lot of home improvement down there, and then I met this this a Jamaican lady, and we got married, and we stayed married for thirteen years, and she died a couple about a year ago. So the traffic got so hard, but down in that area around Atlanta, Georgia, so I was tired of filled up with the traffic. So I just moved back here, and I've been back here now a couple weeks, about three weeks now. What do you want me to know about Sawani, about the history, about what, what life is like here? Well, Sawani, like in the um, 60, 70 years ago, it used to be about, on average, 300 blacks that was in Swanee most of the time, you know, because most of them worked for the university and like, uh, you know, it was just like a nine month job, seemed like, because when school's out, you know, like some still work because they had summer schools and stuff. But then uh, the rest of them went back to Winchester. You know, they was from Winchester, Decatur, somewhere down the mountain. And 
Swanee, you know, eventually people just started, black people just start moving out of Swanee. Why do you think that is? Well, a lot of them moved up north, you know, better, they, better jobs and opportunities. And nobody was moving to Swanee because, like, you buy a house up here, you don't own the land. You know, you just lease the land. And if the university don't like you or you do something that they don't like what you do, they can say, uh, you got to go. But, you know, it just... It's just the way things is, you know, but if you buy a house off the mountain, you know, that the university don't own it, you don't pay your taxes, they say you got to go. You know, so it's six of one and half a dozen of the other. So like right now, I think it's about maybe 13 or 15 people. Black people still live here in Swanee. Wow. What do you hear about um, other people's experiences here? Were there any bad incidents that you? I can't really recall, you know, uh, any bad incidents uh, here in Swanee, you know. It's always been, you know, a very nice place to live, you know. Um, did you feel that the university, though, controlled everything? The, you say they owned all the land. They, was it pretty, well, I, I, don't, I guess they didn't control everything, but. They, uh, everybody, with everybody working for the university, it was kind The of majority of the people that lived here at one time or another worked for the university. What made you not want to work for the university? When I, well, when I was a teenager coming up, you know, it wasn't a lot of job opportunities. You know, it's like you got five fingers, okay, we got three different jobs. You take it or leave it. What are those three? Work for the university, work for the university, <laughs> work for the university. You know, I mean, it, that, that was just the way it was. So back then, my, my way of thinking was, you know, well, you work for the day at the hospital, you know, but it still is on university, you know. And then they had, uh, used to have, a, I think it was a, a, a white uh, private school, SMA, I think it was. You know, but it's still on the university land. You work for, you know, you, you work for the establishment. Uh, there wasn't no work up here to be done. So that was my main reason, you know, out of high school, I said, no, I, I can't work at the mess hall or cleaning up. And I, you know, I, I said to myself, I don't think that's for me. So like I said, when I was right out of high school, I left. And you like doing Construction? Have you done that other places? Well, I started off, you know, you, you buy a bunk, bought a house, and had a few little things, and then I thought back to my little uh, high school general building trade. So I went to Lowe's and Home Depot, and I bought me a manual on how to fix. And something went wrong, I got that book and I read that book. I read it again, I said, I can do that. And I just started doing stuff like that. And uh, 
Like I retired from the military when I, was, when I turned 50. Okay, I was in Washington, D.C. area. And I went right in to the home improvement full time. And I, I, I used to make real good money. Like, for, like I retired when I was 50 for the next, until I moved down here back to take care of my mother, I never touched none of my retirement checks. Because, you know, like, my home improvement was so good that I paid out for all my bills. And I thought everything I had to pay out, I had, I was heading uh, anywhere on, on the average of $5,000 extra every month to spend for whatever I wanted to. But, you know, like I used to tell people, if you're going to do a job, you got to do it right. If you tell people you're going to show up at 8 o'clock, be there a little before 8. Don't come at 10, 15 minutes after 8, you know? And that's been my theory and motto all the, you know, ever since I can remember. Did you have a name for your business? Uh, yes, I did. It was, uh, what was it? Wow, can't even think of that. But I have a little co I have a little one of my old little business cards out there in my truck. And before I leave I okay. I show it to you. It's a little yellow card. Did others work for you? From time to time I would get somebody to help me, but it was it was hard to find somebody, other guys that could do what they say that they could do. And you know, like, I charge, like, I used to, for good, for good example, like a door. You know, like people on the, uh, say like that door over there, that's the exterior door. Mm -hmm. Now, when I put, not the price of the door, but my label was $200 to install that door. And I could do it in about 40 minutes. You know, when I got through, the door was just like, as they say, downtown, you know. But, you, you know, like, it's just like anything you do, I used to tell people, you got to know what you're doing. I was thinking about you putting up your mother's house. You did a lot by yourself. I did. I'm, I say I did. 65, 70%. But most people up here tell you that I did 80% of it. You know. Do you paint also? You did. I paint. I can do plumbing. Roofing now, I do not like roofing. And I put the roof on, you know, the shingles on this, on this house I built for my mother. But that's the only time that I ever been up on a roof. Cause I seen guys slide off roofs. But uh, that was the only time I ever did some roofing work. So, and all of this was generated from your training in, in high school? All from there. Do you have the same feeling about, well, did other students really benefit from that? Uh, I know of three guys that I went to high school with that uh, after they got grown or even you know, moved out, that they did home improvement from there. Who was your teacher that taught you that? Uh, his name was Mr. Campbell. And what do you say about him? He was an excellent teacher. You know, because when he when he taught you something, he taught you the right way. You know, you know, it's like on anything that's the right way, your way, and the wrong way. You got to go with the right way. You know. Did you actually build something? Build a build a room? 
when I was in uh, when I was in high school, we didn't do you know like we built tables. We used to make cheers, you know, like you had to cut out and look at the pattern and do uh, you know whatever he was going, whatever project he assigned it. You know, you had to look at the blueprint and cut your wood and sand it and. You know, you just had to do everything according to the blueprint. And then you went home and you built your room. You you seem to have a knack for for going ahead and doing something. You know, you know, it's like this. You got people that you know they they uh, they sit there and they look at something. They will concentrate on it and. Then they get up and go over there and they look at it. But my theory always been like this. If you got something to do, get up and do it. And um, I should have something I was going to say. I guess it wasn't important, was it? I can't think of it now. But um, I guess... We have come full circle. Is there anything else that you wanted to say that I have not touched on? Well, you know, it's, it's so many things that I know it's up there, but I just can't pull it out because, like, when I, you know, Vietnam, you know, they, them chemicals that were sprayed over the there. Agent Orange? Agent Orange, you know, it it messes with your mind. And like, you see guys, you know, been to Vietnam, and a lot of them, they say, oh, ain't nothing wrong with me, I'm 100%. I'm 100% good, you know, but it's been a proven fact that, you know, them chemicals, they don't, you know, it, it, you forget things and, it's just so many things that it's just like this young fellow that he been to bed. Uh, he was in bed now. That's okay. <laughs> he know you can get things. Are we doing okay yeah. over time? Or is it all fine? We we we. Okay. Well, we're 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 good. Um, so you did get exposed then to chemicals. Anybody that was in Vietnam, they got exposed to chemicals. You know, like they say, if you had foot on ground one day, them chemicals was floating around in the air. You know, so. Now, it didn't make you sick to go in the hospital? I didn't get sick or nothing, you know, but... Uh, like different guys have different things wrong with them, you know, and it just, for good example, I'm, I'm a hundred percent disability because of the different chemicals, you know, that it's about, I think about 15 different things that, uh, that they have, you know, they say, okay, these 15 things, if you got these and you was in Vietnam, 99 times out of 100, they come from there. You know, so. Gosh. Is there any, yeah, we just don't know all that, that went on there. The people that weren't there, it's hard to even imagine. Did you feel that you weren't treated right when you came back? Actually, nobody was treated right. You know, you came back from Vietnam, people spit on you, throw rocks at you, cuss you out. I mean, not only black, blacks, whites, anybody that went came back from Vietnam. At that time, you know, they are mistreated. Was that uh, with the, the move? against war, the peace movement, or who was doing that? I, I really don't know how that came about, but, you know, 
like after the Vietnam conflict, uh, you know, like guys that went to Afghanistan, different other places, you know, they they come back hero, you know. So now, you know, like people is we got a uh, they changed the mind about you know the Vietnam veterans, you know they they treat you better and. And how is there something that real that specific that occurred that that you want to tell about? You said you were spit on, or not specifically you? Every, no, it did make no difference who you were. When you came back from Vietnam, and uh, I think it was in in 70, 71, somewhere along in there, they treated you like you don't stole the last supper, you know. Um, let's see, what else? Um, you had said that um, the well, I guess I'm trying to get back to Suwanee to to see were you mistreated here at all? No. No. You know, like Suwanee is always to me it's always been a great place. The only thing that I saw wrong with Suwanee was job opportunities, you know. And but you know, like I said, it's a university, it's no cooperation or nothing here. So, you know, you only got a certain amount of work that a person can do around here, you know. Tell me about holidays here. You mentioned Christmas a little bit. Well, they had Christmas and then Easter, they used to have Easter egg hunts and... Did they have a parade? I don't, I can't remember them having a parade back then. Where were the Easter egg hunts done? They at, at the church or somewhere like that, you know. Did the ladies dress up special for Easter? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Or did they wear hats, special hats? Some of them had on maybe a little bonnet, you know, uh, but I really don't remember that too much. How about Thanksgiving? How were that? How was that celebrated? Thanksgiving was just like you know, each individual home, you know, had their little Thanksgiving like that, you know. Did they have turkeys? Mm -hmm. Did your mother have to uh, spend Thanksgiving cooking for the white family? She used to cook, you know, like, like Thanksgiving, she would cook maybe like the day before, but she was always there to, on us, you know. And, but she would have to go to the white family home for a good part of it? No, um, Thanksgiving Day and Christmas Day, she was always at home she was with us, home. yes. So she would cook for them ahead of time. Uh-huh. And how about for, um, uh, well, we said the 4th of July, how was that? It was just, when I was coming up the 4th of July, you just had some firecrackers in you, you know, uh, some sparkles or something, you know. That's all there was back then when I was coming up. Did they have a 4th of July parade? I don't remember them having one. Did Sawani have any parades? I don't think, I don't think, I can't remember them no. having them. And um, I guess that's the main ones that I can't think of anything else. Um, well, I think we've come covered a lot. Is there this, is anything popping out? Did you ever hear any stories of slavery around here? No. Uh, there, there's one thing, uh, and like when my mother died, you know, now, you know, the principal church don't, 
they don't have an open casket in the church. But like when my mother died, I was going to have uh, the funeral down and, and the weight and the funeral down Winchester. So it was, I can't, I can't remember their names, but it was three of the ladies up, the white ladies from up here in the university, you know, they came down and said, child, said, understand, you're going to have a, the wake and all them, I told them, as I just, as I can't do it, wakes and down in the funeral home and then church, you know, funeral the next day in the church. So she said, well, I said, if you could have it all right here at, off the audience, I said, would you do it? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I would. I said, but I, I said, I know Episcopal Church rules. They don't have no open casket. I said, well, if, the, if he could have it here, would you do it? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, we'll be back. He came back a couple hours later. I said, Charlie, oh, the Paris. So, you know, like, ready as you go in. You been there, Odie? I have. Okay, when you first go in, it's a little foyer, and they had the open casket out there, you know, in the, in the way. So then, you know, uh, a few years later, I had done moved, but I was told that it was a, a white family up here. They, you know, Luminize used to give the university millions of dollars a year. And said the husband died. And the lady wanted to have the weight and everything. So they told us, said, we don't do that. Just for church. So she said, well, y'all get it for they said, right? So they, they said, well, that was Lace Bright. Killer of the rock. None before, none after. And they, they say this lady got so mad, she sold her house and left Swanner. But, uh. You said Lacey Bright, Pillar of the Rock? Who, who named her that? That's what, I don't, I don't know, that's what, you know, everybody, everybody in Swanee knew my mother. And my mother was a mean lady, too. <laughs> you know, like, she cussed them out, didn't make her no different, you know. But they just, they just loved them some lace some rice. Well, she must have been doing a lot of good for people. What, it, what was she doing? She was cooking for him, caring for him? Uh, no, it was just her personality, the way she was, you know. She ain't, when she said something, she bite her tongue, she tell him just like it is, she cuss him out. Then bother her, you know. But everybody seemed to love her. Yes, they did. They respected her? That's a good memory to capture. Thank you for sharing that. You ready for me to stop this? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for this. <laughs>